In Zhangjiaku, China, in October 2017, something extraordinary unfolded in a rural community located 120 miles from Beijing. It all started when the residents stumbled upon a fascinating discovery in a field. An immense 60-foot set of bones. These bones belonged to a highly peculiar creature, unlike anything they had ever seen before. The locals believed that these bones belonged to an ancient dragon. Dragons hold great significance in Chinese culture, depicted in historical murals throughout the ages. However, scientists remained uncertain about the true nature of these remains. They couldn't conclusively identify the creature to which the bones belonged. Hence, the mystery surrounding these mysterious bones remains unsolved to this day. I hope they're dragons. That'd be so sick because that would just make the world so much more interesting, which I guess we have some pretty amazing creatures and experiences and locations and stuff currently that I think we should probably take more pride in and, you know, be a little more fascinated by and not just only depend on the possibility of there being more than what we know. But we really got to start taking more time to appreciate what we have, you know, because, I mean, in a lot of cases, what we have is more than enough. Uh, there are some very amazing places and very awesome creatures that I think don't get enough attention and respect from most people because everybody is just like always wishing they had more and an overabundance of things that we don't necessarily need even though it would be amazing if dragons and unicorns and and all these things were true what the The city is applying pesticides to reduce the threat of West Nile virus. This is a creepy... Look at this. What the f*** is going right in my window? Yeah, man, that's pretty nerve-wracking. You figure they, they release mosquitoes that are supposed to be helpful to us, and then they are releasing pesticides to combat a virus that is transmitted through mosquitoes. Man, they're just not even trying to cover up this whole population control thing, are they? This man was haunted by a demon that mimicked his girlfriend's voice. Giovanni Lima and his girlfriend Laura lived a fairly normal life in Brazil. But one night as they slept, Giovanni was awoken by something outside his room, mimicking his girlfriend's voice. A week later, things get worse. Fuck. Nope. That's not happening at all. There's there's no way I'm staying in that place. I'm going to set the house on fire and then I'm going to have the fire department put out that fire with holy water to make sure that motherfucker's gone. I'm doing it. Boom. Sleeping in a tent from now on if I don't give a shit. The final mission to save mankind has failed. The 70 mile wide asteroid known commonly as Matilda is set to collide with Earth in exactly three weeks time. Could be scary. It's self-printed, self-published, and it's by an author I've never heard of. Two divided by three, point six six six. Six six six, number the devil. of the month of September, in an early year of a decade not too long before our own, the human race suddenly encountered a deadly threat to its very existence. Some alien life force has sent real life video games to attack us.
Again, man, I don't know. Um, I'm not saying that there's no merit to numerology, but as I said in previous videos, if you look hard enough, you can find the answer that you're looking for in anything. You have to think about how many movies are released every year. And to only have a very small percentage, let's say a thousand movies are released in a year, and then three of those movies just happen to have the number 23 in them. You know, at that point, you're just kind of like, like reaching for that, right? Uh, with that being said, uh, today is September 22nd, and I'm recording this video to be released on September 23rd, tomorrow. And that is another complete coincidence. Or is it? That first one, the first clip, dude, I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm going to run away, but I'm also going to beat the shit out of that ghost in that wig. This is going to happen. Uh, it's, I'm not a violent person, but if you jump out of my closet wearing some fucking crazy shit, looking crazy, you're going to get beat up. That's all I'm saying. And then I'm going to run away, screaming like a small female child. Is Stonehenge a massive Neolithic musical instrument? Well, believe it or not, there is a theory that it was. In 2015, a chap called Paul Devereux from the Royal School of Arts, they commissioned a study where they went round to the Preseli Mountains, which is the source of these lovely blue stones we see in front of us. Yes, I know they don't look blue, but the ones from Wales, and striking them in different positions with this idea that the stones would sing and resonate in different ways, and that might be the reason why they appear at Stonehenge. And they were even given permission by English Heritage to come to Stonehenge and strike some of the stones and they discovered that when you hit some of these blue stones in different positions, they create different notes and hypothesized that perhaps the acoustics of Stonehenge itself is just as important as the solstitial alignments. Oh, interesting thought. Anyway, have a great day. That's a super interesting theory. Um, I know that I just saw a video recently where some temple, probably, I think it was an Aztec temple. I feel like it's always an Aztec temple. I mean, aren't there, there are other kinds of temples, right? This temple essentially was created in a way to where the acoustics allowed the sound from the, the podium to resonate through, essentially. So someone could be standing on top of the podium uh, and the people standing within the crevices uh, in this like auditorium style temple would be able to hear him talk clearly without them having to, you know, speak through like a some something amplified. That's pretty interesting. I'm gonna look more into this. The lost city of Heraklion, Alexandria, Egypt. An ancient city exhumed okay, okay, from the depths of the face. ocean.
I think it's pretty exciting to me and also kind of creepy that they find all this ancient stuff, these old cities, uh, like underwater, like just this. Um, I don't know. I don't think this is the same one, but Lost City of Hercules, they think they just found as well under the water which was said to be a myth kind of like the city of troy was for a long time like all these places that are underwater um mainstream archaeology has found like one continent that's like underwater and i guess it's been proven that there were people that lived on that continent but it's interesting because how much water is all around us all the the land masses that are exposed right now if the majority of that was once above sea level that means that that's probably just like strewn about with with things to be discovered from other civilizations and interesting scary uh it, it's all very very cool to me no matter what hey did you know that an area called doggerland once existed in europe it was located in the present day north sea between england the netherlands and denmark doggerland existed towards the end of the last ice age about 11,000 years ago about 10,000 years ago the ice age finally ended and the water levels began to rise Doggerland eventually disappeared underwater, and Britain became an island. Now you know. Not sure what's there exactly, how advanced it was, you know, what they had, or what we know so far, but there's an entire, like, massive area that people were living on that is now under the water. I mean, it's just another one, right? So, don't know if it's Atlantis, don't know if it's, you know, not Atlantis, don't know what they had, the capabilities or anything, I don't know, but uh, super interesting. Right? Not really creepy, but you know, it's interesting, so. The Antikythera Mechanism. The Antikythera Mechanism is an ancient Greek device found in a shipwreck dating back to around 200 BCE. Only a few of these devices have been found, and it is often referred to as the world's first analog computer. With gears and dials, this remarkable bronze device could accurately predict solar and lunar eclipses and determine the positions of the sun and moon in the zodiac. It could display various calendars, including the metonic calendar used in ancient Greece to track lunar months and the calypic cycle, which spans 76 years. Finally, the device could also track the positions of several planets, including Mercury, Venus, Mars, Jupiter, and Saturn. Its whole purpose to this day is not fully understood, and its creator still remains a mystery, but it highlights the sophistication of ancient Greek science and technology, revealing their ability to explore the cosmos through complex machinery. It's so insane to me that that was discovered to existed that long ago, and just 150 years ago everyone was still riding horses. The epic poem written by Homer called the Iliad speaks about the city of Troy. Now did you know that the si that city did end up existing? When I say it did exist, I mean that the ruins that we have left of it is barely even ruins, it's more pieces but than anything and that is because of the person who discovered it by the name of heinrich schleiman schleiman here was a wealthy businessman who had so much money he ended up going on a little crusade of looking for mythological sites from you know greek mythology so he tried to look for the palace of agamemnon which turned out to be the city of My uh, mycenae he also tried to look for troy and as you know he ended up finding it or Ish. Relying mostly on all of his sources, he ended up finding this little mound that was located in modern-day Turkey at this man's estate, who he even claimed saying, "I believe, like, th under this mound, I believe the lost city of Troy would be in there." So he ended up asking if he can go and do some excavating on it, which the man obviously said, "Sure." But the way he was like, excavating was a little different than most. Now, when it came to excavating this mound, trying to find Troy. Digging it just seemed a little boring, so Schleiman was like, I have a lot of money, so let's go and use the best invention that had come out during the time, dynamite. So, he, you know, he blew up the mound. And, as you can see on this little map here, they, we ended up dividing this mound up into different layers due to all the different ruins that was found that came from different time periods. So, Schleiman blew up the first layer and was like, this can't be Troy, so he keeps blowing up the different tiers until he gets to the second uh, level, or as we call it, Troy level 2 or whatever. Now this level, he was like, when he got there, he saw all these bronze and gold tools, and he's like, I gotta get these things checked out. When we studied them, it turned out that was dated to the year of 2400 BCE, give or take, which was a lot earlier than 
when Troy actually, like, the mythological version that w was told in the Iliad was a lot, like, it was a lot earlier than it was actually built. So, you know, Schliemann accidentally kind of blew up the city of Troy that is told in Homer's Iliad. Unknowingly, at least. Dude, as infuriating as that is to hear, it's still pretty... F I can't help but to laugh. How do you... <laughs> oh my god. This this mythical city that is spoken about for thousands of years that nobody can find, that everyone is, you know, looking for, treasure hunters, archaeologists, whatever, for it to be proven to exist, and someone finally finds it and they blow it up trying to find it. <sighs> Bro, F's in the chat for Troy. What if I told you that there's a possibility that the Statue of Liberty is actually a statue dedicated to Lucifer? The left is a painting made in the 17th century, known as Satan summoning his legion. Now the devil's original name in the Bible was known as Lucifer, or in Hebrew, Helel, which means the light bearer or the bringer of light. Now the Statue of Liberty is holding a torch, it's bearing the light. Now the Statue of Liberty looks awfully similar to the Colossus of Rhodes. Now, the Colossus of Rhodes was one of the ancient wonders of the world. It was a bronze Greek statue. It was about 108 feet tall. And just like the Statue of Liberty, the Colossus of Rhodes has a crown of light. It's holding a torch. This statue was dedicated to the Greek god Helios, the god of the sun, the god of the light. In fact, many Luciferians refer to the devil as the great light. And this painting of Satan summoning his legions looks awfully similar to the face of the Statue of Liberty. I mean, take a look similar to me but it's just a theory who knows ah uh, man could you imagine seeing the colossus of Rhodes like in person how like beautiful that that statue would be though to like see in person nowadays man i wish i wish all this old stuff still existed dude i love museums and and art and sculptures and stuff so much but as far as the statue of liberty goes I mean, it kind of makes sense. <laughs> it kind of makes sense in the literal sense, right? Of it being like, you know, the light bringer. But I don't really know much else outside of that. So I don't know if you have any more information on the Statue of Liberty and the association with, you know, Lucifer or even Helios, because um, there are a lot of similarities there, obviously, between those two statues. Uh, you let me know. Let me know in the comments. Our government has been working with aliens all this time. There is a conspiracy theory called the Serpo Alien Exchange Program that suggests that the elites have been in contact with the aliens for a really long time. Well, you see, according to this theory in the 1940s, a UFO crash in New Mexico led to the government recovering a living extraterrestrial that came from the planet Serpo, located in the Zeta Reticuli star system, some 39 light years away. This extraterrestrial known as the Ebens started facilitating contact between Earth and Serpo, teaching humans about their technology, including their light speed propulsion technology, basing themselves in New Mexico, a place where the UFO sightings might not just be a hoax anymore. It was also alleged that 12 humans were actually sent to live in Serpo among the Ebens for decades. And while the actual purpose of it is still unknown, the question we should be asking is, how much more do we not know? If we didn't know that. So let me ask you this. If you had the opportunity to be sent to live on an alien planet, uh, just to, to study it, to learn about it, interact with them, would you do it? Would you experience the, the trip there, the, the whole experience of, you know, traveling wherever they're at, seeing their world, eating their food, um, seeing their wildlife, their just, just everything, just the differences uh, between their culture and their existence and ours? Would you do it? Because I like my life. My life's pretty cool. I love my friends. I love my family and stuff. But I also just love learning and experiencing new things. So I think I would totally do it. Have you heard about the Agartha Network conspiracy theory? It's the idea that the Earth is hollow and a secret society called the Agartha Network lives inside. They supposedly have advanced technology and supernatural powers and control major events in human history from underground. Some people even believe the entrance to their world is in Antarctica. But there's no scientific evidence to support this theory, and it's widely regarded as a conspiracy with no basis in fact. What do you think? Let me know in the comments. So maybe you can answer this for me. If there's no evidence, and there's, there's, there's nothing to base this theory on fact, where did it come from and how did it pick up so much steam? I know people write sci-fi novels, you know, people write movie scripts. I'm a, I'm a writer. I write like scripts for 
commercials and stuff like that. That's what my day job is. So obviously people are very capable of coming up with, you know, these amazing ideas and these, these, you know, made up places and things. But for something like this, like a theory to actually kind of take hold in this place like Agartha, where does that come from? If you have any more information on Agartha and like where this whole theory like started, where it came from, please let me know in the comments. I definitely want to look more into it uh, and, and share more of that in these videos. So that would be awesome. And that's today's video. Thank you for watching, you guys. Um, this one was a little bit different. Um, I, I just really wanted to really talk about more of of what we know is is like true, right? And just kind of like learn more about that. Like the conspiracy theory stuff is super fun, you know. Thinking about like what if and like like what we don't see. But what about the things that we have? You know, the things that are here, like Stonehenge. Like dive into that and kind of figure out more about that. Because the more I look into this stuff, you know, it's really great learning about all these conspiracy theories and stuff like that. But also, like, I'm very interested in you know ancient history, uh, mythology, uh, and things like that. So let me know if you want to see more of like. The, the stuff that we can actually go and look at. Let me know if you want to do more of that along with these videos. If you have some videos you want me to check out, uh, join the Discord. The link is in the description and you can drop the videos in there for me to see and then talk to everybody else in the community. It's really great. Everyone's super cool. Um, and yeah, that's it. So until next time, peace.